Hi there. My name is Heather Ordover. And since 2006, I've been hosting the Craft Lit podcast. Basically, it's annotated audiobooks where I give the Cliffs notes that you might need, and then we listen to the audio of the chapter together. And that's the way we go through lots and lots of books in the previous 18 years. It's what I do. And so when I woke up November 6th, I realized I'd been meaning to do this for a long time, and there is no time like the present. So we are going to read together Brown-Breaking Essay by Mary Wollstonecraft. She's the mother of Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. And sadly, they never really got to know each other because I think eight or nine days after giving birth to Mary, eventually Shelley, Mary Wollstonecraft died because pregnancy is dangerous. You need to know that she wasn't doing this in isolation. She was responding to two main people and one main event. The two main people, Thomas Paine wrote The Rights of Man. Edmund Burke wrote a treatise explaining the French Revolution, but definitely from an upper class point of view, and definitely not with women in mind. Mary Wollstonecraft wrote The Vindication of the Rights of Men in 1790, building on what Thomas Paine had started. And Edmund Burke and a particular French writer, and actually church bishop, they didn't like what she wrote so much. <laughs> and so what you're going to hear first is the letter that she put into the book, a letter that she wrote to the guy who dissed her publicly about vindication of the rights of men, because now she's got, okay, two years later, vindication on the rights of woman, and she will not mince words. The opening letter is just a little bit snarky, but it, the whole thing is going to get snarkier as we go. So things to know before we start. Is this an old text? Oh my God, yes. Is the language and the syntax outdated? Holy cow, Yes. Is it going to use language and terminology that we simply would not use today? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. But try and listen to the arguments she is making more than the words she uses. She will even tell you at one point that she is not going to round her periods. She's not going to mince words and make it look pretty just because it might upset people. She's all in for the ideas. You should know that any time you see all caps in the captions, that's her emphasis. Any other notes you see are mine. You will notice, if you're paying attention to it, so much funky punctuation in the captions. This is the only way I could get the captions to break across separate screens to help me make clear some of her more complicated sentences. So I apologize, the English teacher in me is horrified, but it was the only way I could control what you were seeing and make it easier for you. And I know you're going to think this was easy, but it will get easier, I promise. The notes will go by fast. Just a reminder, no one can see you hit rewind. Just saying. I, I had to rewind myself a lot when I was writing the notes. So yeah, be prepared. I am going to read the thing all the way through. I am not going to be doing any audio notes. All of my notes will be text on the screen. This is not being released as a regular podcast. It's only here on YouTube. And there are plenty of things that I couldn't address in a note because it would just require a page. In those cases, I found a source for you and created the link, and that will be in the show notes in the description box below. Please also, if you have sources, write them in the comments so other people can learn from what you bring. Oh. All right. Thank you for reading Mary Wollstonecraft's 1792, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. The letter. The letter that opens the book. Your Talleyrand Paracord, late Bishop of Atun. Sir, 
Having read with great pleasure a pamphlet which you have lately published on national education, I dedicate this volume to you. The first dedication that I have ever written to induce you to read it with attention and because I think that you will understand me, which I don't suppose many pert whittlings will, who may ridicule the arguments they are unable to answer, but, sir, I carry my respect for your understanding still farther. So far, that I am confident you will not throw my work aside and hastily conclude that I am in the wrong because you did not view the subject in the same light yourself. And, pardon my frankness, but I must observe that you treated in too cursory a manner contented to consider it as it had been considered formally when the rights of man, not to avert to women, were trampled on as chimerical. I call upon you, therefore, now to weigh what I have advanced respecting the rights of woman and national education, and I call with the firm tone of humanity. For my arguments, sir, are dictated by a disinterested spirit. I plead for my sex, not for myself. Independence I have long considered as the grand blessing of my life, the basis of every virtue and independence I will ever secure by contracting my wants, though I were to live on a barren heath. It is then an affection for the whole human race that makes my pen dart rapidly along to support what I believe to be the cause of virtue. And the same motive leads me earnestly to wish to see woman placed in a station in which she would advance instead of retarding the progress of those glorious principles that give a substance to morality. My opinion, indeed, respecting the rights and duties of woman, seems to flow so naturally from these simple principles that I think it's scarcely possible but that some of the enlarged minds who formed your admirable constitution will coincide with me. In France, there is undoubtedly a more general diffusion of knowledge than in any part of the European world, and I attribute it, in a great measure, to the social intercourse which has long subsisted between the sexes. It is true. I utter my sentiments with freedom that in France, the very essence of sensuality has been extracted to regale the voluptuary, and a kind of sentimental lust has prevailed, which together with the system of duplicity that the whole tenor of their political and civil government had taught, have given a sinister sort of sagacity to the French character, properly termed finesse, and a polish of manners that injures the substance by hunting sincerity out of society. And modesty, the fairest garb of virtue, has been more grossly insulted in France than even in English, till their women have treated as prudish that attention to decency which even brutes instinctively observe. Manners and morals are so nearly allied that they have often been confounded, but, though the former should only be the natural reflection of the latter, yet, when various causes have produced facetious and corrupt manners, which are very early caught, morality becomes an empty name. The personal reserve and sacred respect for cleanliness and delicacy in domestic life, which French women almost despise, are the graceful pillars of modesty. But, far from despising them, if the pure flame of patriotism have reached their bosoms, they should labor to improve the morals of their fellow citizens by teaching men not only to respect modesty in women, but to acquire it themselves as the only way to merit their esteem. Contending for the rights of women, my main argument is built on this simple principle, that if she be not prepared by education to become the companion of man, she will stop the progress of all knowledge, for truth must be common to all, or it will be inefficacious with respect to its influence on general practice. And how can woman be expected to cooperate unless she know why she ought to be virtuous? Unless freedom strengthen her reason till she comprehend her duty 
and see in what matter it is connection with her real good. If children are to be educated to understand the true principle of patriotism, their mother must be a patriot. And the love of mankind, from which an orderly train of virtue spring, can only be produced by considering the moral and civil interest of mankind. But the education and situation of woman at present shuts her out from such investigations. In this work, I have produced many arguments which, to me, were conclusive to prove that the prevailing notion respecting a sexual character was subversive of morality. And I have contended that to render the human body and mind more perfect, chastity must more universally prevail, and that chastity will never be respected in the male world till the person of a woman is not, as it were, idolized. When little virtue or sense embellish it with the grand traces of mental beauty, or the interesting simplicity of affection. Consider, sir, dispassionately these observations, for a glimpse of this truth seemed to open before you when you observed, quote, that to see one half of the human race excluded by the other from all participation of government was a political phenomenon that, according to abstract principles, it was impossible to explain. If so, on what does your constitution rest? If the abstract rights of man will bear discussion and explanation, those of woman, by a parody of reasoning, will not shrink from the same test. Though a different opinion prevails in this country, I built on the very arguments which you use to justify the oppression of woman. Consider. I address you as a legislator. Whether when men contend for their freedom and to be allowed to judge for themselves respecting their own happiness, it be not inconsistent and unjust to subjugate women, even though you firmly believe that you are acting in the manner best calculated to promote their happiness? Who made man the exclusive judge if women partake with him in the gift of reason? In this style argue tyrants of every denomination from the weak king to the weak father of a family. They are all eager to crush reason, yet always assert that they usurp its throne only to be useful. Do you not act a similar part when you force all women, by denying them civil and political rights, to remain immured in their families groping in the dark? For surely, sir, you will not assert that a duty can be binding which is not founded on reason. If indeed this be their destination, arguments may be drawn from reason and thus augustly supported. The more understanding women acquire, the more they will be attached to their duty, comprehending it. For unless they comprehend it, unless their morals be fixed on the same immutable principles as those of man, no authority can make them discharge it in a virtuous manner. They may be convenient slaves, but slavery will have its constant effect, degrading the master and the abject dependent. But if women are to be excluded without having a voice from a participation of the natural rights of mankind, to ward off the charge of injustice and inconsistency, that they want reason, this flaw in your new constitution, the first constitution founded on reason, will ever show that man must, in some shape, act like a tyrant. And tyranny, in whatever part of society it rears its brazen front, will ever undermine morality. I have repeatedly asserted and produced what appeared to me irrefragable arguments, drawn from matters of fact to prove my assertion that women cannot by force be confined to domestic concerns. For they will, however ignorant, intermeddle with more weighty affairs, neglecting private duties only to disturb by cunning tricks the orderly plans of reason which rise above their comprehension. Besides, whilst they are only made to acquire personal accomplishments, men will seek for pleasure and variety, and faithless husbands will make faithless wives. 
Such ignorant beings, indeed, will be very excusable when, if not taught to respect public good, nor allowed any civil right, that they attempt to do themselves justice by retaliation. The box of mischief thus opened in society. What is to preserve private virtue, the only security of public freedom and universal happiness? Let there be then no coercion established in society and the common law of gravity prevailing, the sexes will fall into their proper places. And now that more equitable laws are forming your citizens, marriage may become more sacred. Your young men may choose wives from motives of affection, and your maidens allow love to root out vanity. The father of a family will not then weaken his constitution and debase his sentiments by visiting the harlot, nor forget in obeying the call of appetite the purpose for which it was implanted. And the mother will not neglect her children to practice the arts of coquetry when sense and modesty secure her the friendship of her husband. But till men become attentive to the duty of a father, it is vain to expect women to spend that time in their nursery which they, wise in their generation, choose to spend at their glass. For this exertion of cunning is only an instinct of nature to enable them to obtain indirectly a little of that power of which they are unjustly denied a share. For if women are not permitted to enjoy legitimate rights, they will render both men and themselves vicious to obtain illicit privileges. I wish, sir, to set some investigations of this kind of float in France. And should they lead to a confirmation of my principles, when your constitution is revised, the rights of women may be respected, if it be fully proved that reason calls for this respect, and loudly demands justice for one half of the human race. I am, sir, yours respectfully, M.W.